Well, here we are. I guess I was wrong to expect our heroes to be sleeping right by the entrance. Whoa! This place is much larger on the inside! Oh. Oh. Huh? Someone bumped into me! Oh wait, she had an American accent, didn't she? Someone bumped into me! Who is there? Sorry, I saw you coming into this temple and I thought, well, the other elves scare me and you saved me from the undead back there, so... Be gone, goblin! This is no place for such a lowly creature like you! Oh, he can come with us. I'm sure the Lady of Light will not mind the intrusion of a goblin and his pet wolf, considering the circumstances. Oh, many thanks, my lady. Oh, I had never been so well treated by non-goblins. Many thanks. This is... I can't believe I, we are about to meet one of our ancestors and her human companion in life. I wonder what they look like. I imagine they look like every other elf or human sorcerer. Just much more powerful. And maybe even terrifying? Alright. Scenario 11, Ilinia. Find the Lady of Light and the Master of Darkness. No turn limit, as far as we can tell, though there is an early finish bonus, so I don't know how that works. Um, if any of my four heroes are killed, I will lose. Uh, that includes Althea in now. And I have to just find the Lady of Light and the Master of Darkness. So it's not a big squad, but I do get Unari the Sorceress, and I do get Igor the Dark Wolf, Dire Wolf Rider, um, who is, uh, you know, he's kind of proven himself, I think. So I, I shouldn't, I hope, need to be too worried about what happens in here, though we shall see. It's progressing slowly, anyway. What's this? Is this a brazier of some kind? And there's an empty chest up here. Well, Kashar, you go this way. Maybe Igor, you can go and check out the chest. It doesn't look like I can actually go that way. Looks like it's blocked off. The chest is empty. Still gonna lead with Malkashar, just because he's an absolute beast, basically. Oh, we've got a gate. We should be wary of any traps or enchantments set up to protect our heroes from hostile outsiders. Anlinde, could you inspect that gate? Sure. Uh, he's got more defense here and it's a better position, but I'm tempted to put him here. Just so it looks like they're doing the conga. Conga, conga, conga. Won't do it. So, what I need to do is move on Linda next to the gate, which I will now do. There is a stone tablet nearby. Here in this chamber lies the slayer of the demon lord, protector of the elves of Erdia, wielder of the power of the union. Elinia, the Lady of Light. Only those born of fairy and the sacred earth of Erdia shall be allowed within her resting place. May her eternal sleep end once the wounds inflicted on Erdia have healed. There doesn't seem to be anything else special about this gate. Why does it only mention her? I believe we fit the description, but I am unsure about the healing part. Still, we have faced all kinds of trials and braved numerous dangers to get here. There is no turning back now. Onwards!
the group entered a massive chamber at the center of the underground temple. The place was abundantly illuminated through openings in the tall ceiling, rendering their torches and magic pointless. The whole chamber appeared to have been built not by an ancient civilization, but by the earth itself. Standing out amidst the chamber was a lush courtyard enclosed by five trees in a geometric arrangement, with a sixth tree in the middle of it all. An eerie gust of wind from the deep abyss below extinguished the fires, as though intent on protecting the secret sanctuary from harm. Hello there! Anybody home? There is no one here. But how? Did we arrive too late? Kill the intruders! We are the forest elves of the Valley of Elinia. You must let us pass. Protect the Lady of Light. Oh, they're gonna kill us. Enough of this nonsense. Malin Keshar, what do you think you are doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Unto me, Whip of the Dark Gods. No need to thank me. Behold! On the ground where the white tree at the center of the chamber stood moments before, now lay a beautiful elven lady. In a previous age, when Erdia was green and wide, anyone who glanced at her radiant, pale skin and glistening fairy wings would have been able to discern her identity without a second thought. Even as she slept, her strong bond with the essence of light illuminated her surroundings and protected her from harm. The legends told of the lavender-haired heroine of the elves and lauded her everlasting grace and splendor, but Galas never imagined the truth could possibly surpass the historical accounts. Neither did he imagine how it would render him completely dumbstruck, unable to greet her as it was required of him as Lord of the Elves. She is... Come forth, Light of the First Gods. Awaken your blessed emissary from her millennial sleep. Who has awakened me? Uh... Elves! Huh. I must be dreaming. Actually, no. Not at all. Necromancer, your kind is not welcome here. Say your last words. No, he doesn't mean any harm, Lady Alinea. He is our ally. Ally, you say? Who are you, strangers? And why have you come to interrupt my sleep? Right, right. I forgot to introduce ourselves. I am Lord Galas of the Elves of the Valley of Alinea, my lady. And these are Anlinde, my loyal advisor and leader of the Elven Council at Telchior's Hold, Lady Unarie, High Sorceress of our people, Althurin, High Rune Master of the Dwarven Kingdom of Hathgar, and this is Malkashar, the Harbinger of Dread. A title I just made up, so I don't seem out of place among those big names. I. And I'm Igor, but I fear I don't have any titles or feats to brag about. I mean, I appreciate that you would name a valley after me, but Lord Galas, do you even realise that you are standing behind two criminals condemned by elven kind? How could this depravity come to be? Is this truly Telchior's legacy? How am I supposed to trust the elves of this time now? Because... I presume it has been long since the fall, hasn't it? And you are a descendant of Lord Telchior of Thelion, aren't you, Lord Gallas? Uh, perhaps? I beg your pardon, my lady, but the only person here who I am aware has committed crimes against elven kind in the past is Malka Shah. And I have specifically allowed him amongst us so he could guide us to the Heart Mountains and to you. So you were raised unaware of the most crucial chapter of your people's history. 
that actually makes sense. Why are you all here today? Because the demons have returned, my lady, this time in greater numbers and backed by an empire established by the humans of the southern deserts during the last few centuries. They decimated our defences, razed our lands, and slaughtered countless innocent civilians before we finally left our home to request help from you and the Master of Darkness, who seems to be absent for some reason? The Lady of Light seemed suddenly distraught at Anlinde's words. She breathed deeply and turned around, trying to avert the inquisitive glances, and remained silent for a moment. And then she turned around once again. Argon, the Master of Darkness, is dead. I... I never imagined. It pains me to have to admit this truth to you. After our victory against the demon lord Zangor in Wesmere, many elves, your ancestors, Lord Gallas, were convinced that we were like gods, immortal and invincible, the exclusive wielders of the only power that could rival the demon's own. But it was only by sheer fortune that we survived that battle. And our lives, even though they truly exceed the norm of our kind and span, are as fragile as those of everyone else. We learned this the only possible way, by one of us dying. As to how it happened, I suppose I might as well tell you of the world-changing events that led up to it. Our stories are more closely intertwined than you might suspect, Lord Gallas, and because our people have apparently forgotten the tragedies that befell us all at the end of times, I shall try my best to provide you with my own abridged account. You have to know the truth that Anne Linde has kept from you for so long. But I must warn you, if the law keepers of Elvenkind chose to not pass this knowledge on to you and your forefathers, it would be highly unwise of us to do otherwise now that our civilization is once again on the brink of extinction and susceptible to the influence of demons hurling from Inferno. Which is why all of you standing before me now are forever bound to keep this a secret. Sit down and listen well. Once upon a time, the great continent was dominated by many human kingdoms, united under a single banner, the banner of the Empire of Westhoff. But elves and dwarves were here first, and inhabited the vast green forests and tall mountain ranges. Although they had come to see the humans of Wesnoth as valuable friends, many remembered that the humans first arrived to the continent with legions of orcs in pursuit. But by the Golden Age, we had all managed to set our differences aside and prosper together. South of the Hart Mountains lay one of the greatest and oldest domains of our kind, Wesmere. For long it served as the capital of our civilization, with its elven council, the Kalyan, holding greater authority than our own kings and lords. The members of the Kalyan valued knowledge over all other things, and they sought to plunder all the secrets of Erdia for the greater good. In time, this would bring about our downfall. But the first step towards ending our peaceful lives was taken not by Elvenkind, but by the Empire of Wesnoth. At the time, the human emperor saw his popularity among his subjects dwindle. He saw fit to take advantage of an otherwise unremarkable incursion of undead in orcish territory, led by a powerful necromancer said to have been destroyed countless times before. You must still remember this, Malkishar. I have lived for, uh, I don't know, thousands of years? And you suddenly expect me to remember one specific instance of me terrorizing these despicable creatures? <sighs> it served as the perfect excuse for the Emperor of Wesnoth to take the fate of Erdia into his own hands. He ordered his magi to gather masters and students from all academies throughout the land. Together, they lifted a mountain into the skies to shine forth and force all soldiers of darkness to retreat underground until the end of times. That is Naya, the second son. Centuries later, things happened in Wesmere. There is no one still alive who remembers exactly how it all began. And in the end, 
Argan and I had to rely on hearsay to put together the pieces of the puzzle. As part of their experiments seeking to unveil the nature of our reality, the most skilled sorcerers in Wesmere discovered a way to open portals to another world, and from one of those portals emerged a young elf seer who warned them of disasters to come, disasters that he claimed would destroy all elvish civilization, and with it the knowledge hoarded by the good people of Wesmere. He promised them protection and more knowledge in exchange for being worshipped as a god. That was Zangor, and that was the pact he proposed to elvish civilization. Knowledge begets power, and power begets ambition. The offer was only too enticing for the lords of Wesmere. Those who disagreed with the Kalyan's decision to accept the demon lord as their god would be the first to meet him as offerings. As part of his requirements, these blood sacrifices were to remain a secret concealed from the rest of the world. And because of this, for a long time, we remained unaware of the corruption that took root in Wesmere. Dangor's claims were proved true after but a few years following this. A nobleman by the name of Danter became Emperor of Wesnoth six years later, since the previous holder of the title had left no heirs to take the throne. The mysterious circumstances of his decease led people to suspect Danter of regicide. With Wesnoth civil unity at stake, two years later, Danter saw no option but to quell his detractors with a decree for the immediate creation of Gaia, the third son. But his confidence in his plan was too great, as Wesnoth had only seen threats of mundane origins for two centuries, and the old masters had long since passed away. The human magi were no longer the impressive force that once created Naya. Dantair went ahead with his plan, and took measures to ensure nobody could possibly interfere. Thus, to my heart's pain, I came to witness the mayhem the Magi realized only too late that they were unable to tether Gaia up in the skies. Their failure resulted in the fall of the third sun and the end of an era that later came to be known as the Golden Age. The earth-shattering force of the impact caused cataclysms and eruptions all over Erdia, destroying forests, cities, rivers, even mountains. The great continent was entirely reshaped and the fruits of civilization were destroyed all at once. Perhaps for the best, Dante did not live to see the full extent of the damage he caused. He and his magi were murdered by the panicked people of Wesnoth, and thus their sad story came to a swift end amidst the destruction. So, it's true, after all. The humans were far from the only ones to suffer the calamities that resulted from their prideful actions. Elves, dwarves, humans, and orcs, they all fought amongst themselves for the scarce resources left after everything green perished. Naya and Sela also contributed by drying up every ounce of water on the surface. And while we at Lintinir Forest had to cope with this for some time until the situation proved unsustainable, Wesmere stood intact through everything, protected by Jangor's arcane magic. The unholy sacrifices continued, and soon he saw that he would be left with nothing to rule if the Wesmere population waned further. His thirst for blood became increasingly difficult to quench. Luckily for him, many outsiders sought shelter in Wesmere after the fall. He came up with a simple but effective solution to his dilemma. All foreigners, be it elves or members of any other race, were declared heretics, unworthy of his gift of life. The pain and agony of the unfortunate souls captured by the elves continued to feed him and cause his power to grow stronger and stronger, and when his prey stopped coming to Wesmere, he sent hunters beyond their borders to obtain more sacrifices for him. Finally, Lintonir became inhospitable and we were forced to ask refuge of the Kalyan. Argan and I led my people out of the ruins of the northern forests, and after a long journey across the ravaged land, we arrived at the eastern frontier of Wesmere. Then we were ambushed.
Many of our people were already weak due to the long march from Lintanir, unable to fend off the forces sent after us by Django's cultists. Those of who didn't die during the confrontation were captured and sacrificed to the demon, as my husband later found out. He risked his life to infiltrate the capital and obtain intelligence on our enemy. Thus we found ourselves faced with a difficult choice. Either we could stop our brethren, the elves of the forest where I grew up, and release them from this unprecedented evil at all costs, or instead we could avoid the onslaught and abandon their lands, thus perpetuating the demon lord's cruel rule through inaction. Had we chosen the latter, Elvenkind would likely have flourished once again as the slaves of the demon lord, bound by that fateful pact for the rest of eternity. You certainly wouldn't be here now. Destiny works in mysterious ways, and it was only by chance that we made contact with the elves led by Lord Quetorel of Ethenwood, before they could be lured into a trap by Wesmere. Even though their military proficiency paled in comparison to that of Linthanir or Wesmere, their larger numbers proved essential to make our plan work. Our combined forces laid siege to Wesmere for nearly a year before Django realized that the devotion and fear of his followers would never suffice to turn the tide in his favor. With little chance of prevailing, Argan and I called upon the union of light and darkness, risking our own destruction by overexertion and challenging a foe without precedent in Erdja's recorded history. Of course, we did defeat Jangor in the end, but our power was not enough to counteract his impressive regeneration ability and allow us to kill him, which is why we could only tear his hideous body apart, seal every piece and send them all back to Inferno. Victory was ours, but the cost was much greater than we anticipated, and less than 500 elves of Wesmere survived Jango's display of power, many of them priests and warriors. They surrendered and, ble blessed, uh, they surrendered and begged for forgiveness, and we did spare the civilians' lives. But the surviving priests, warriors, and Kalihan members met a different fate, for we could not risk the possibility of them sparking another civil war or bringing Django or other demons back to Erdja. No, we had no choice but to execute them and then burn their bodies to ashes in case Django's magic could still be at work. In hindsight, it's ironic that we despise the humans so much after their hubris caused the end of all civilizations. Our kin in Wesmere represented the entirety of our race to the rest of the world, and their transgressions were far worse in that they were fully aware of the implications of what they were doing. And in both cases, it was ultimately the flaws of just a few select individuals that doomed the rest. Perhaps, if Jangor and the Kalyan had not conspired, to destroy the integrity of elven kind from within, we would have been able to rebuild what we lost, given sufficient time. Although we elves rarely suffer from lapses of judgment like this, whenever it happens, the results are catastrophic for everyone involved. The recurrence of events like this throughout our history is unsettling, and it's why I fear something like this may happen again if the creatures of Inferno get involved. We had to forbid telling the more shameful details of this story to anyone, elf or otherwise, at least for a few generations. But I expected our law keepers to at least have the sense to educate our future leaders about our past mistakes. To be fair, my lady, I have only recently been given this title by our previous Lord Ledinor, who stayed behind in the valley in an attempt to give us an opportunity to flee. We all owe our lives to his noble sacrifice. My lady, how does this relate to Anlinte or the death of the Master of Darkness? I, I will get to the last part soon. As for her, Telchior was responsible for saving her life. She was amongst the cultists serving Jangor in Wesmere, one of the few who survived the final battle. 
I am fully aware of the crimes I committed while under Jangor's command, my lady. But had I not obeyed the orders given to me, my family and I would have paid the price in blood. Not that any of that helped in the end. I can only hope their deaths turned out to be less painful than how they would have been on the altar. Why did the elves part ways? Would that you were a little more patient. After we had finished dealing with the survivors, Anlinde tried to convince us to head back northeast instead of retreating to the south. Telchior and his people accepted her counsel, albeit reluctantly, while Quetorel returned south. Argan and I would have followed Quetorel's group, but the lengthy war and the final battle had weakened us, both physically and mentally. We chose a third option, which was to descend into the depths of the Heart Mountains. Along the way, we were joined by a few elves, and later, dwarves. Bear in mind that the dwarvish settlements underground weren't exempt of the disasters of the fall, and strong and frequent earthquakes persisted through all those years. But still, we wanted to learn more about the catalyst of Elvenkind's destruction. We remembered that some time before the catastrophe, the dwarves have unleashed the ruins of a civilization suspected to precede ours by eons. Seeing as how the elves no longer needed us, we decided to try and find those ruins. Instead of finding them, we became lost in the depths, and eventually, one of those earthquakes caused the floor beneath our feet to collapse, leaving nothing below but a deep chasm. I held onto a ledge in time and survived, but Argan, he fell into the darkness. I could not find him afterwards. He always managed to escape the worst situations, but never something like that. I still hoped. I hoped he might have survived somehow. But after some time, I, I don't know how much, I realized that I was waiting for the impossible. The few of our followers who were still with me at the time convinced me that the situation was hopeless. And with Erdio ruined and perishing, I thought that my only option was to sleep. Perhaps at some point later, if the world ever recovered. The world is coming back to life, my lady, slowly but surely. Although for a good part of our journey we saw only dunes and dry plains, we also found green hills and valleys before proceeding underground. We have seen but a tiny fraction of our world in its present state, but the country of the northern humans is rumored to be thriving with life. And to support the Chaos Empire's armies, there must also be lands like that to the south. Who is leading this empire against us, though? All their demons and humans appear to serve an emperor of some sort, but they also worship two names that were once subjects of myth, Uriah and Yechnogoth. It is important to keep in mind that the dwarves learned that a creature also called Yechnogoth attempted to eradicate a people of the desert. Elves, who I presume are descended from Quetorel's pact. She had the power to corrupt the souls of all surface dwellers, but those elves, and if the story is true, she also knew the name of this demon lord Jangor. Through her, though her dark influence ebbed away once she was slain by Kalasar, the humans in the south remained under the control of a powerful group of cultists. We believe tis those people who later gave rise to the Empire. So, you will help us? It's my mission as the protector of the Elves of Erdia. It would be dishonourable of me to shirk my sworn duty, for longer than I already did anyway. I shall help you, even, even without Argan by my side. Thank you, my lady. Although everyone refers to me as the Lady of Light, it's not really a title or rank, Lord Gallus. You may call me Elinia if you wish. Now guide me to the other elves, and I want to see the surface again. Yes, the surface. It's been so long since I last saw it. Bah, finally. After such a long talk, I'd be surprised if there were still any life left out there.
the Lady of Light seemed and acted less like a majestic elven sorceress of untold might, and more like a young nymph of the forest, her luminous aspect notwithstanding. Anne Linde said that she had always been more closely bound to our fairy nature than other elves, and hence for most of her life she frequented the wilderness, away from civilization. This became more evident as her harsh exterior slowly gave way to her true self, as we all shared stories and experiences on the long way back to Hrthgar's capital. I do not know if it is because I had always been the reserved sort and never met many women outside the circles of my duty, or because our race changed over generations in some way that was not evident to the eye. Whichever the case is, I found the Lady of Light alluring, like a dream of an age long gone. I wondered if every elf was as radiant as her back in the Golden Age. But her mystifying appearance was merely a distraction for the unwary, for those who had not yet heard her name or accounts of her legendary feats. Soon we would bear witness to her combat prowess and learn how fierce and frightening she could be as the situation demanded. Because, once we neared Hrthgar's capital, we saw not the bustling dwarven settlements that welcomed us after saving Althurin and his men from doom. Instead, what we saw were Anlinde's fears, realized in our absence. Okay, everyone, sorry for skipping a few lines of voice acting back there. Um, my throat's pretty sore at this point. Uh, that was a long piece of exposition. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is why I think this is one of the best campaigns in terms of story told. Um, admittedly, maybe some of that could be shown rather than told, but uh, still, I mean, it's a fantastic backstory. And also the interpersonal relationships, what we see going on here. Malkish are kind of withdrawing more and more into becoming the sort of sarcastic sidekick almost. Um, I, I do love his sort of witty interjections at this point in the campaign. Um, Galas falling in love, um, Elinia emerging, um, and the Master of Darkness. Well, where will he be? I guess we're going to find out. And Linde now, I think, has less control over the situation. Maybe that will allow her to grow and change. Or maybe not. Again, we'll see. Scenario 11, strike on Hrthgar. We made haste towards the keep, in fear that we had arrived too late. Just as I feared, they managed to take down Hrthgar's defences and surround the capital. It matters little. We shall drive them out of the caves, regardless of their numbers. Maybe we could even manage to turn them to our side in death. <laughs> so those are the demons you have fought. They are not as impressive as I expected. They shall pay with their accursed blood if our good king was captured or murdered. Ye had a reason to fear, Althurin. Well, at least I am still alive. Your Highness, what is the situation? Our main defences have fallen, and if we are to have any hope of fending off those demented barbarians and their ever-increasing numbers, we'll need all the help we can master. We will help you, and we shall die fighting if it is necessary. Gallas, this is suicidal. Just look at their numbers. If the dwarves did not manage to hold out on their own, the odds our small group will be of any help are unreasonably low. Look, they are already closing in on us from behind. We cannot leave the dwarves to perish alone. We are indebted to Althurin for helping us find Elinia, and his people need us now. Besides, if Hrthgar is to fall, what other obstacles shall be left to impede their advance towards the Northlands? Lord Gallas is right. We must fight. My lady? But our numbers are small, and we are still weak. Ah, you elves might be weak, but my minions are as strong as ever. Let the slaughter commence. Okay, let the slaughter commence. 
Um, two possible objectives here, resist until the end of turns or defeat all enemy leaders. There isn't an early finish bonus. I don't think defending, de defeating all enemy leaders is actually all that useful in this scenario. Um, and yeah, here we go. Um, we've got more convictions on defeat now. Galas has to survive, Malkashar has to survive, and Linde has to survive, that's no surprise. Althirin also has to survive. King Astorgar has to survive, he can't die. And finally, of course, Elinia, who's just joined us, has to survive as well. There's no gold carryover, no early finish bonus, um, and I have 666 gold, number of the beast in gold. How lovely. So, all right, let's see. I guess I'm gonna get a new bit of information when I get click on Elinia. Elinia is the Lady of Light. She has great mobility, including the ability to fly. Her skill with the staff as a melee weapon is also remarkable, but never leave her alone while fighting well-armored opponents. No, well, I mean, <laughs> six damage, three attacks, not really remarkable. Um, but she is tough. She's got 60, 72 hit points. She's a level four unit. Um, she has some special abilities. She's got an ensnare ability. She's got a magical fairy fire ability. Um, probably most useful is her Sylvan Essence ability. So that gives her various things. It means that she helps lawful units adjacent fight better. That's not fantastic. I don't want her to be next to Malkeshar or Igor because they're actually chaotic. And I don't actually have any lawful units. I think everyone else is actually neutral. Um, the unit can also heal, heal and cure um, up to 8 hit points um, and can regenerate 4 hit points but only on vegetated terrains, um, which down here means mushrooms, so that's worth remembering. Okay, so generally in survival missions I tend to pump out weak units, I tend to think that's a better strategy than uh, trying to push back with strong units, at least till the uh, later stages of the game. So I'm going to, I think, leave everyone unrecalled. Maybe I'll bring that Death Knight out to get some leadership. Uh, that's tempting. Um, let's look at this map a little bit. Okay, down in the south there's a Cataphract. Over here we've got a Soul Hunter. Up here we've got a heavy, Chaos Heavy Longbowman. Right at the top in brown, which is easily missable, we have a Hell Guardian. Over here we've got a Chaos Lawkeeper. Uh, we do have some allies. We've got the White Player, who's a Dragon Guard. We've got Denethor, who's a Dwarfish Explorer. Definitely not a Man of Gondor. And we've got, of course, King Astogar himself. So. It's very, very tempting to try and push out and defeat one of these commanders just immediately. Um, like, if all of these units really push forward hard, it's possible that I could take out this heavy longbowman. Well, they can't attack me in the first turn anyway, so... Let's see what we can do. Malkishar staying outside the radius of the light. But I want you to head south because I think the southern attack in the past when I've played this has been what's overwhelmed me a little bit. Let's recruit some skeleton riders to go south. Maybe a bat or two as well. To go north, I am going to get some skeleton archers, my favourite spam unit. And 
and I can try and claim a few more villages. Okay. So it's only 19 turns this scenario, but each turn is quite long. And it's quite long because there are a lot of units in play in this scenario. So we can see them recruiting a melange of chaos units. Not all of them are level one. Your doom is at hand, Dwarf King. If you surrender now, the Warlord might show some mercy and spare the lives of your underlings. Well, rip you to pieces if you don't accept the offer. We'll never surrender to ye and your loathsome vermin. We shall not give our domain to those who kill everything in sight. Double in the darkest of arts. And they can any diplomacy other than that done with fire and swords. May Earthgar be destroyed and forgotten, but it shall not be remembered as a kingdom of cowards. So be it. Your pride and arrogance has sealed your fate. Attack! Wipe these bearded children out of this place. For Uriah, for the Empire. Hey, it's the pointy-eared rats of the forest. And they made it back with the Blessed One. It matters not. We shall flood the caverns with the elves' blood and bring that creature to the Warlord. Aye. 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 So annoying. Okay, turn two, and with the enemy forces encroaching, that's where we're going to take our break. Sorry everyone, cliffhanger, suspense, but I will be back to defend in part two.